Hello and welcome back um, to the second video of two for module three on verbal communication and I'm Lee Pierce and I'm from SUNY Geneseo and this is my interpersonal class and I teach rhetoric and there's the deal. Um, so for you this is the first time you'll be seeing this video. Um, I just recorded the whole thing and never had my microphone on so I have to do this whole thing again. So I am real fucking tired. As you can tell I went home and took a shower and went to bed and came back to do the second half because that first one wiped me out. Language is complicated, man. Like, uh, I was thinking about it today, right? I was thinking about the semantic triangle. And it's like, if you think about me as a sign or really any like identity, any of us as people as signs, we have our signifier, right? L-E-E -E or whatever your name is, is your signifier. But then there are all these signifieds that um, go with your signifier, right? So, and depending on who you ask, those signifieds could look very different. So there are gonna be people who you ask like, who am I or what do you think of me? And their signifieds are gonna be totally opposite or very contradictory to the set of signifieds that someone else is gonna bring up about me. But of course, they're all me. Um, and it makes you wonder like, do I really have a referent? Or am I just one giant bag of signifieds? Like I obviously have a referent, like I have a physical material body, but what I mean to people is all a matter of the concepts that kind of float around in our collective heads and they all belong under that signifier, Lee. And that's stressful. Like it's, it's really hard to wrap your, your head around. Um, but that's, it's just true. It's just the way it works. It, intuitively, it makes sense even if it's uncomfortable to think about. So uh, what that also points to though is sort of the two concepts. We're gonna talk about a couple concepts today. We're gonna talk about um, <clears throat> dialectics binarism, binary thinking, and then agonism. So we'll start with dialectics. So th those are the only three. So this is shorter than the other one. Man, I'm so tired of talking about this. All right. So that tension that we have where someone could say, oh, what does the signifier L-E-E -E mean to you? Like, what is your signified? And they could say, oh, my signified is super organized and on top of her shit, right? There are people who would describe me as very organized, like very on top of my shit, crosses the T's, dots the I's, right? Always answers my email fast, um, always gets stuff done on time, always gets it done quickly, and they never have to sort of follow up to make sure I've done what I need to do. Then there are people who would describe me as highly disorganized, late, kind of always running behind, frazzled, unreliable, right, that kind of stuff. And so how is it that both of those signifieds could belong to the same person? Well, it's because our identity is a bunch of contradictions. Our identity isn't a couple of things that are all related that all kind of show up in the present. They always show up in the absence, right? So I'm not only the things that I do, I'm also the things that I don't do. And sometimes when I'm doing one thing, um, the exact opposite is happening someplace else. So in order for me to be highly organized in some areas, I have to be highly disorganized in other areas because the condition of possibility for my being organized is that I am not always organized. Because if I were always organized, nothing would be organized, right? That's dialectics. And the theory of dialectics highlights the tensions or struggles or sort of the contradictions between two contrary tendencies. So even though the tendencies might seem to be contradictory or not make sense together, they in fact do make sense together, right? Because we as humans were paradoxes or oxymorons. We are two things that shouldn't necessarily go together, but they do. So in my case, it shouldn't be possible for a person to be highly conscientious and also not highly conscientious all at the same time, but it is, right? That's the dialectical nature of our behavior. Um, it's also the dialectical nature of all verbal communication because every sign that we use, every signifier that we put out into the world, um, like L-E-E, -E, like A-M-E-R-I-C-A-N, American, like S-T-U-D-E-N-T, -E student, like uh, B-L-A-C-K, black, right? All of those signifiers, all those signs, have competing significations attached to them. And part of our problem is that we use words only with the, signifi only with the signifieds that we want to use, and we act as if those other signifieds aren't already attached to our language when they are. So for example, I can't show up to a class as L-E-E, -E, the signifier, attached to the signified of is very, very organized because there will be people in that class who have taken me before or people who have read my Write My Professor or people who have heard about me through the grapevine and they will have attached to my signifier the signified not organized. And so I have to remember that I have to navigate that organized, disorganized tension 
And I can't just decide that today I am organized, right? I mean organized. My, my, the definition of my name should be associated with organization. A, I don't get to decide that. And B, it's impossible to only have the good of something and not also have its opposite. So it's impossible to decide that I'm always going to be highly organized without recognizing that the condition of possibility for my being organized is that I will also be in other areas disorganized. So there are lots of different forms of dialectics. Um, we're going to focus on verbal communication, but in the next module, we will also focus on how your relationships with other people are also dialectics. Um, so every sign is a dialectic. Every verbal sign is a dialectic, symbol sign, visual sign. Within a single sign is a set of tensions that cannot be resolved. We try to fix or stabilize those tensions with like definitions or strict grammar or like clarifying ourselves. But ultimately, like every sign contains the traces of its opposite and that just can't be resolved. It's just the way it is. That's why a dialectic is a tension and you as a communicator always have to sort of manage and be aware of that tension. Now, real quick, dialectics sounds a lot like dialect. A dialect is like an accent or a regional way of speaking, right? So some countries that all speak, say, um, maybe the national language is Hindi, they're going to have multiple dialects that are part of the same culture but are not part of the national language. Or in the United States, um, our like official version of American is kind of like an, a northern dialect. But there is also a southern dialect, right? There's also a city dialect. I mean, there's a lot of different dialects. Dialect is a different word. It's not dialectics. I'm sure they have a relationship. I don't know what it is. But don't think about dialect here. Think about dialectics. And a dialectic, right, is a tension between two things that should be opposite, but in practice they're not. So it's two. It's a tension between two competing but related ideas. And the theory of dialectic states that everything you do, every identity, every behavior, every relationship that you have, every noun essentially, um, is a dialectic because it's not a thing in the world. It's it's the name of a tension that you have to navigate. So let's take the sign unity, so the signifier U-N-I-T-Y. Uh, we like think we know the definition of that word, right? It means like togetherness or harmony or consensus or acting as one. But of course, like unity can't exist without division. So the signifier unity always contains the seeds of its opposite. So for unity to be possible, like among a group of people, like one night at Geneseo, right, for us to be unified, um, we have to have division for unity to exist. So you can't have unity without division. You also can't have division without unity either. So when we say that we must be unified, like well, let's, let's unify, like practice unity, the sign unified always contains division. So in order for us to be unified, who are we going to be unified against? Um, whom do we have to exclude for us to achieve unity? Unity, like for whom? Like who gets unity? Who gets to belong to unity and who doesn't? So every sign and its definition is just like a provisional attempt to stabilize this endless play of signifiers or signifieds. But um, ultimately, like unity does not have a specific definition that is present to itself. It doesn't have a definition where I can say point me to unity and you point me to unity because whatever you point to, whatever you think is your referent for unity, it's always going to contain other reference that don't belong to it, that have to be excluded, and that is why language has signified. It doesn't have reference, typically. The referent is this imaginary material thing, but for the material thing to have meaning, it has to have signified. So the dialectic approach contends that multiple points of view play off one another in every contradiction. A dialectic view of thinking emphasizes both and approach to language instead of binary. So for example, if I am in charge of like, improving the school's unity, um, one thing I have to ask myself is like, who isn't currently included in that, in that idea of unity? And I have to bring those people in. And of course, by bringing those people in, I threaten the people that, are already, that already think of themselves as part of the, of the school, right? So it's this constant process of managing that whenever you wanna add things in that have not traditionally fit the definition or the signified of your signifier, you're gonna create, you're gonna destabilize meaning. And that's why people don't like to do that, because we like meaning to be stable, but it can't be because the world changes, and as the world changes, your language has to change with it. You can't try to resort to um, all of these outdated definitions of things when they don't belong. And when people say, like, oh, your unity doesn't include me, like, that's something we have to respond to. 
a couple, um, years ago, John Locke, who was a, like a 16th century, might have been 17th century political philosopher, he tried to make a, de- a dictionary um, that was just like 1,600 words. He tried to take the whole English language and just say, okay, instead of having like nine synonyms for the word unity, instead of unity or harmony or togetherness or consensus or agreement or whatever, I'm just going to make up one word. And that word is going to have this definition, and we're just going to use that word for all of these different concepts. But of course, that falls apart because harmony is not the same thing as unity, is not the same thing as consensus, is not the same thing as agreement, right? And so you need new words to represent the fact that there are going to be new ideas and new ways of thinking. So the dialectic view is a both and. So yes, I have this concept like unity. Um, but I need that to also include the opposite of unity, which is disunity or disagreement. Because if I don't, then I don't ever have true unity. Unity is something I work toward. It's not something that I actually have, right? So this idea of unity is sort of fictional because you're never going to have unity because all unity has disunity within it. So the opposite of dialectical thinking is binary thinking. So di means both, right? Diagonal, so it's like cuts across. And bi means either. So bi is split. So binary thinking is also sometimes called black and white thinking or thinking in extremes. And binary thinkers want to resolve contradiction. They want to polarize. They um, like two mutually exclusive opposites. They don't like the idea that there are no opposites. Everything is kind of enmeshed. And binary thinkers have a high need for certainty. And they have very, very low, they're very intolerant of ambiguity. And becoming tolerant of ambiguity is the best thing you can do for yourself as an interpersonal communicator. Getting used to the fact that you're not going to be certain, you're not going to be able to resolve problems immediately, and that your whole life is just one giant process of revisiting and solving problems and trying again and failing and trying again, that is the key to productive interpersonal communication, right? It's the, it's the key to having a life of productivity and happiness and self-fulfillment. You have to get really comfortable with ambiguity. Binary thinking is one of the ways that we avoid ambiguity. But it requires us also to kind of be very like lazy with our language. So let me give you an example. Um, you and I have been dating for a while and I really want to get married. I want to start having kids. I want to get a house. So, But you're like not pulling the trigger on proposing to me. So I sit you down and I'm like, listen, we either need to break up or we need to get married. What that is, is it's a forced choice, right? And if you've ever learned about logical fallacies, this is known as a false dilemma. I want you, it's not, first of all, it's not really a choice. Because I don't, it's an ultimatum. I don't want you to break up with me. I want to get married. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even said this in the first place. Um, but of course, the irony here is that by forcing this choice on you, I've devalued the concept of getting married in the first place because I'm trying to force you into that agreement that relies on you entering into it voluntarily. So I got to be honest, if anyone ever sits you down and says to you, we either need to break up or get married, they have already made the choice for you, which is you should break up with that person. Because what they've proven is that getting married is more important to them than you being a willing and um, valid participant in the relationship. Likewise, if somebody presents you with that choice, you can say, um, no, like there's lots of other choices. For example, we could get engaged and not ever get married. We could get legally partnered. You could go pursue having a child while we date. I just don't necessarily want kids. Um, we could stay in a committed relationship and just not move in together. So there are all kinds of solutions to this problem that are not one of those two. And for some of us, <clears throat> like for people who kind of have a lot of choices and they get stressed out by choices, a forced choice can be helpful. But again, that's not binary thinking. That's just putting productive constraints on your mind to discipline it and help it make decisions. But um, you don't, but you recognize that these are just decisions you made for the sake of having to make a decision and that there are other decisions you could have pursued. You don't act as if there are only two decisions and it's one or the other. And people break up and get married all the time. I mean, they get married, they get engaged, they break the engagement, they get divorced, they get remarried. I mean, breaking up and getting married are in some ways like, again, it's a dialectical tension because in order to truly be married to someone, you have to have entered into that contract voluntarily, which means you have to be willing to break up. So if you're in a relationship where someone will never leave you, like they just won't no matter how badly you treat them, you're going to have a pretty unhappy marriage because that person is not really there by choice. So this gets real thorny when you get into religion where you're not supposed to get divorced, but um, some religions, but I'm just talking in the pure sense of married as a signifier and then like broken up as another signifier. 
we think of them as sort of the opposite. There's like life to- lifelong, absolute 100% commitment. And then there's no commitment. We don't even have a relationship. But of course, that's not really the way most of us experience our life, right? For, with people who we truly feel passionate about, we're always kind of in this tension between wanting out and wanting to be committed. And we'll talk more about that in the next unit. Um, so here's another example. When my dad voted for Trump and I said, okay, so why'd you vote for Donald Trump? And he said, well, I didn't really, because you know, my dad's an environmentalist. And I was like, dad, I don't know why you would vote for Trump. He, like, he's very anti-environmental policy. And my dad says, well, I didn't vote for Trump. I voted against Hillary Clinton. So for my dad, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are the exact opposites. Now for me, who knows and believes, well, I should say believes, even though I also think it's a fact, but I, I can't put that on you. Um, that the Democrats and the Republicans are more similar than they are different in the sense that they both have a um, they both have a vested interest in the two-party system and so they collude. So even though they kind of represent opposite ideas, they actually are always kind of mutually entwined with each other. To me, that's that's silly, right? That my father thinks that these are two totally different choices. But the other thing I find strange is that he acts as if he didn't have another choice. Like if he didn't want to vote for Donald Trump, but he didn't want to really vote for Hillary Clinton, he acts as if his only choice was between those two, which is what the two-party system wants you to believe. But he could have voted for like Jill Stein of the Green Party, right? My dad's a huge environmentalist. Jill Stein's an environmentalist. That could have been the, the, the vote. Um, but the other issue is that my dad also loves guns. Like he's, he's a hardcore Republican conservative. He likes his guns. He likes his low taxes, right? He buys into that whole conservative ideology just like I buy into uh, different ideologies. So he uses this binary logic to try and make sense of the choice because then he doesn't have to admit the very, very obvious contradiction that's glaring at him, which is that he wants gun, he wants loose gun control, right? He wants a lot of gun rights and he wants environmental protection at the same time. And those two things represent opposite sides of the political spectrum. So he would rather make up some kind of binary choice where he was like forced to choose Trump because he doesn't wanna have to say the very uncomfortable sentence when I have to choose between supporting someone who supports gun rights and supporting someone who supports the environment, I chose guns over the environment. But that is essentially what wound up happening, right? So the binary thinking is a way of getting out of that discomfort. But of course, that means my father can never grow or seek to reconcile his behavior. It also means he's never gonna go and try to seek out a political candidate who's both in favor of gun rights and the environment and back them, right? Because he's stuck in this binary thinking where when he's presented with these two choices, he could, he had to choose one. Um, it keeps him comfortable, right? He doesn't have to challenge his beliefs. He doesn't have to examine his self-concepts. He doesn't have to look at the contradictions that he is as a human being, which is very uncomfortable. Um, but hopefully what you're willing to do as a result of, you know, kind of like taking this class and being enmeshed in this new political environment and hopefully having like a more flexible, supple brain that wants to be creative and insightful is you'll start thinking about yourself and all of the contradictions you represent. And instead of using binary thinking to avoid those contradictions, you use dialectics to examine them and try to try to look for different ways to knit together your personality and your characteristics and the things that you believe in. All right, um, so the other thing that happens with binary thinking that I think is interesting is when I teach people a lot of these units, like with the big five personality traits, if I teach them about these five and, and I say like, hey, you know, if being low on conscientiousness, so you're kind of messy and disorganized, that doesn't work for you and it's giving you trouble, like why not try being more conscientious, right? Like maybe you could try this or maybe you could try that or maybe you could agree that the dishes always get done or maybe you could agree that you're always going to set aside time on Sunday to do your laundry, right? Things that would, things that you have told me would help you out. The thing people always say is like, well, yeah, but then I I don't want to turn into some type A neat freak who like can't ever function because my house isn't clean. Um, Like, is that what I just said? Like, is that what I told you? Did I just tell you that the solution to being low on conscientiousness, but, but, but wanting maybe a tidier space or an easier time in the morning getting ready or being able to find stuff? Did I say that the solution to that was to go the opposite direction and turn into a total new, neat freak? No, of course I didn't say that. That would be stupid, right? Um, but your binary thinking is one way that you keep yourself from having to entertain the thought that like, oh, well, actually I could do the hard work of adopting a couple of these conscientious habits because I would really like to live in a cleaner environment. So you use binary thinking as a way to get out of it. And that's fine, that's your choice, Um, but that is what's happening. And so you should at least acknowledge that you're choosing to stay comfortable uh, 
not that the not not that this is real, but that this is just how you're choosing to stay comfortable. Um, and this happens a lot too with the optimistic, pessimistic, explanatory style. So I'll explain to people like, oh, you're kind of exhibiting several of the P's of a pessimistic explanatory style and I can imagine that that kind of makes you feel like a victim of your life and you don't feel in control and you probably have like low self-efficacy because of it so maybe we could pick one of these P's and you could think about this differently so right now for example you're saying that if you got a bad grade on a test it's going to mean this and you can't enjoy your vacation next week and you can't be with your friends tonight and you can't have a social life and you're you're um you're over here in the sphere of sports and things aren't going to go so well for you right so that's a highly pervasive, pessimistic, explanatory style where you're saying that something that happened to you bad in one domain of your life is going to affect all of the other domains. What if we don't think that, though? Like, what if we just say, okay, the one thought I'm willing to think is, yes, I did get a bad grade in my test, but that just affects the grade in this one class. It does not need to spill over to my other classes, my schoolwork, time with my friends, my family, this vacation I'm going to take, whatever. And then people will be like, well, I don't want to turn into an optimist because optimist. So first of all, this is the signifier optimism. Um, and when I use the signifier optimism, O-P-T-I-S-M, as, as in, the, in, in terms of an optimistic explanatory style, I'm not using it the way that we use dispositional optimism. So dispositional optimism is the idea of being like optimistic. The glasses have full, right? That's not the signifier I'm trying to use. I'm trying to use the signifier learned optimism or optimistic explanatory style, which is a very specific way of explaining events to yourself using pervasiveness, permanence, and personalization. It has nothing to do with being happy. I am not an optimist, a dispositional optimist. I am, however, a person with an optimistic explanatory style most of the time. But when I tell people that, they're like, they think they immediately substitute the signifier learned optimism or optimistic explanatory style same, so same, same signifier, right? So let's say that optimism, explanatory style, and dispositional optimism, let's say we have the same signifier, they instantly substitute out a bunch of signifieds, not the signifieds that I've taught them, but these other signifieds of like naive, gullible, just like cheerleader type, believes everything they're told, right? So they'll say, oh, I don't want to be like one of these cheerleader types who's just always bubbly and optimistic. I don't want to get taken for a sucker. I don't want to be taken advantage of. And it's like, yeah, that's not what I fucking just told you to do. Like, I did not tell you to go from being someone who's in their diaper about a shitty grade and a test to being someone who's a naive, optimistic doofus who just walks around like singing Sound of Music songs all day. First of all, that's not possible. And second of all, that would be a stupid piece of advice, right? So if you want to think of it that way, because it's more comfortable for you to just assume that the opposite of a pessimistic explanatory style is naive, stupid optimism. Like if that keeps you comfortable and makes you not have to change and means you don't have to do the hard work of working on your brain, fine, totally your choice. But that's not what I said. Because the opposite of a pessimistic explanatory style is not naive dispositional optimism, right? It's just a tweak to say you could be a touch less pessimistic about your pervasive P. That's that specificity, right, and that nuance of language that you have to be careful of down on that concrete level of the ladder of abstraction because if you shoot up to that abstract level where you're talking about optimism this and optimism that and pessimism this, people have way too many signifieds attached and they start not being able to hear what you're trying to explain. So you got to pull people down to the concrete level of like, I'm talking about the pervasiveness aspect of your pessimistic explanatory style and how trying to be less pervasive when you explain bad events to yourself might shift you to a slightly more optimistic explanatory style. That's the concrete level of that explanation and it avoids all of this kind of meta language. Um, but that's the binary option, right? The binary thinker can't slide up and down the ladder of abstraction. They jump. When you make a specific suggestion for what they could do, they jump up right to the top of the ladder and then they jump back down and they do that to avoid having to think about the very uncomfortable middle part of that ladder and to do the very uncomfortable work of sliding between examples and outcomes right they kind of want to stay at one level or the other that's that dead level abstracting that we talked about so um so binary thinking um is assuming that the only response to your current set of behaviors and ideas is the opposite and that the opposite is mutually exclusive of what you do now so that's not true there's gray area to everything. And it's really just a bullshit lie that you tell yourself so you don't have to do the hard work of changing a behavior that's kind of ingrained in your mind. So binary thinking puts you at risk for a whole bunch of issues, including um, 
you tend to think in extremes, you tend to not be solution oriented, and you also tend to have a high rates of victimage about your life. You tend to play the victim a lot. Um, it, binary thinkers are not great parents. They're not great teachers uh, because they don't uh, live in the gray area where everyone else likes to hang out. They like to live in the black and white areas uh, and it's impossible to live in those places. Now, does that mean some things aren't binary? No, uh, I get a hard binary rule against like pedophiles. I'm going like, all black and white on that. But so few issues in interpersonal communication are like that, right? So certainly there are some things that you are welcome to take a hard line against. But for the most part, you're not, if your biggest interpersonal problem right now is that you're hanging out with people who are just like, you're morally opposed to them and they do things that like morally upset you, like murder or infidelity or pedophilia or just something else awful, like what the fuck are you doing with those people? Like that's not an interpersonal problem. That's a whole other some kind of like, you, you probably need counseling, honestly. That, I, that's way beyond the scope of this class because, because your biggest interpersonal problem typically is not that. Um, interpersonal problems are more gray area problems typically because they have a set of signifieds and a set of logics and you have a set of logics and they don't go together. And rather than try to think about how they're already kind of mutually entwined, you think about just the opposite. That's, that's the binary thinking problem. All right, um, so binary thinking is afraid of conflict, it's afraid of disagreement uh, because it believes that there has to be a right and a wrong. When you take like an either or approach, right, it's kind of either you or me, you're kind of with us, or you're with the terrorists sort of thing, and disagreement is very uncomfortable and it's also kind of scary. Unless, of course, you're one of these competitive styles who love disagreement because you want to like vanquish your enemy, but like if you're having a argument with like somebody you care about which is what interpersonal communication is and your goal is to like vanquish your enemy uh, I don't know if that's the attitude you want to be taking right like you get to choose your metaphors and if your metaphor is like I am the victor of this fight that's an interesting metaphor to choose for someone that you care about whereas um, you may want to entertain other kinds of metaphors so and of course disagreement is going to be uncomfortable because if you believe that like the only outcome is someone wins and someone loses um, and people are going to be mad at you and you're going to have to like stomp all over people to get your way, then of course you're not going to want to do it because it's going to be super stressful. And we often think that the solution to this problem is to find these like perfect win-win outcomes, right? We're going to collaborate. We're going to compromise. We're going to be more empathetic. We're going to listen. And yes, that stuff's important, but um, taking a more win-win or ethical attitude toward conflict or disagreement doesn't resolve it because it's dialectic. You can't resolve the contradiction. It's just going to be there. However, what you can do is get better at productively disagreeing, right? So you can see the tensions, you can notice them for what they are, and instead of getting mad about it and trying to like take one side against somebody else's, so if somebody's like, oh, I'm a liberal, and then you assume that the opposite of that has to be I'm a conservative, that like that's not true because What's the signified to liberal? Like, what do you mean by that? And where in those signifieds are you like, oh shit, that's actually the same signified that I would attach to conservative, right? And it gets real funky there, but you haven't bothered. First of all, they used a high level of abstraction to talk. And second of all, you didn't think about the fact that every word is a tension. So there's always a point in tension where a word is gonna contain its opposite. And that's where you can find not necessarily points of agreement, but you can find ways to at least be able to have productive disagreement with someone. So the best thing you can do with disagreement is kind of get used to it, get comfortable with disagreement when it happens and make it like a process problem, not a you problem, right? So all of this is just endemic to language. When we use verbal communication, when we try to explain ourselves to people, there's just process problems there because of dialectical tensions. It's not about you. It's not about you being bad at expressing yourself. It's about not about you being a sucker. It's not about you being a doormat. It's just, it's a process problem and language is hard. I mean, that's just kind of the bottom line. Language is hard and you just gotta keep trying to get better at using it in ways that create better problems than you have now. Because that's all you're really ever gonna do is just up-level your problems. Um, okay, so again, the objective is not to disagree or reach uh, or just agree. Uh, it's to just have productive disagreement. All right, so this is the principle of agonism. This is our last topic from this, which is so good because I'm tired. Okay, agonism from the Greek word agon, which means struggle. It's a theory that emphasizes um, the potentially positive aspects of certain forms of conflict. It accepts a permanent place for conflict, but also 
looks at how that conflict being all there is can be channel channeled into more productive sort of relationships with other people. Agonists are, um, instead of aiming to create dissensus or agreement or harmony, right? So if we think about like you and another person fighting, if, um, if you're saying that like, I'm trying to think of a sports metaphor because I use a lot of po po political metaphors. If you and another person are trying to decide like what you're going to do this weekend and they're dead set on going rock climbing and you're dead set on wanting to watch Netflix in your pants, in your sweatpants, right? You've got two, or no pants, I don't know, however you like to roll. Um, you got two signifiers there, right? You've got sort of like the, 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 the hard work rock climbing signifier, which means like sweating and grunting and doing all this stuff. And then you've got the... Um, like the chill, comfort, I don't want to be challenged kind of signifier. And the two of you are going to argue over those signifiers. Instead of asking like, where are your signifieds kind of the same? And of course, what you're trying to both do is spend time with each other. But we forget that because we get in these fights about whether or not I should have to go rock climbing. Um, but if you think about the signifieds, you're like, okay, well, what you want out of me rock climbing is you want to spend time with me and you want me to challenge myself. And what I want is to spend time with you, but I don't want to challenge myself. And then you can actually have like, and of course that's going to be uncomfortable because then your partner is going to be like, I don't know why you just won't challenge yourself more. To which you might want to respond, um, I challenge myself all the time. I just don't want to challenge myself rock climbing. And now you have a better disagreement. You may still never come to terms with them loving rock climbing and wanting you to participate and you not wanting to, right? You may never solve that problem, but you can at least get to a place where they understand why you don't want to do it. And maybe they can be sympathetic to you. And maybe you can be sympathetic to them. And maybe, hell, who knows? Maybe if you do this long enough, you come up with some kind of solution where you both feel challenged by something, but it doesn't challenge you so much that you don't feel like you're getting your leisure and relaxed time over the weekend. So that's, but the thing is, is if you don't have an agonistic approach to disagreement where it's productive and conflict is necessary and inevitable, you're never gonna get to the place where you're able to do it well because you're always gonna be so scared of it that you're gonna avoid it and you're gonna avoid it and you're gonna avoid it and then you're gonna have to do it and you're gonna do it badly because you went in there all upset about shit. And then of course it's gonna suck and so now all you've done is reinforce the idea that conflict sucks. But that was always a thought, it was always a choice um, and you're just not engaging in the kinds of behaviors that would make you make better choices. All right. Um, now, agonism is not antagonism. So I'm not saying here that we should all just be like really excited to just cause trouble for each other and just play devil's advocate or people who like to like troll the internet. I have no patience for trolls. Like I am not the kind of person who wants to argue for the sake of arguing. I don't want to sit here and have a debate. My chair is so rolly today. Well, I have a debate just because like listen to you just, just play devil's advocate. Like if you're not actually invested in the disagreement, don't fight with me just because you want to fight with me. I mean, that's just like, there's enough shit I have to actually fight about and disagree about. I'm not going to like drum up disagreement for the sake of disagreement. That's antagonism, right? Antagonizing somebody. That's not what we're talking about. Agonism is not simply just the undifferentiated, just celebration of just antagonism and stressing people out just because you want to do the opposite. Um, people love to celebrate this. Like, some, the other day I told someone something about that. I said like, well, you're a conservative, so of course you would feel that way. And they were like, I'm not a conservative. I'm a skeptic. I'm a liberal skeptic. I said, okay, well, what does that mean? And they were like, well, it means that when someone says, this was a professor on this campus, by the way, not in the comm department. And they were like, well, that means that whenever people start throwing around these words like diversity or inclusion or predominantly white institution or whatever, I'm going to question those because, you know, I, I'm not just going to accept doctrine about diversity without actually critically examining it. And I was like, okay, but basically all you've told me is that when I say diversity, you're just going to say the opposite. That's not critically examining anything. That's just you trying to be binary, right? That's not agonism because you're not engaging me as an equal. You're just trolling me because you don't like that I'm being cliche. And that's fine. I don't like when people are cliche either. But if someone is thinking a cliche thought, I'm not going to just try to do the opposite to get a rise out of them. That to me is not productive. That's the Socratic method, right? I say one thing, you say the exact opposite so that we can try to come up with some kind of like meet in the middle. That doesn't work. Um, dialectics doesn't mean that you just do the opposite of stuff because there are no opposites in dialectics, right? There are contrary tendencies that seem to compete 
but in fact, they're already mutually ingrained with each other. So the opposite of diversity, which is homogeneity, those things aren't really opposite because to have diversity, you have to have homogeneity in some places and some homogeneity in some areas is what allows you to be diverse in other areas. So it's like they're already part of the same and being antagonistic doesn't help to untangle that knot. It just gets people upset. And I don't need people to agree with me just for the sake of agreeing with me, but I certainly don't want someone to like just pick apart an argument for the sake of doing it if you're not going to get anything out of it. So um, agonism is more like, so to use a sports metaphor, right? The Greek agon, this metaphor, I don't know if this is true. I mean, I don't know enough about Greek history to know if this was real, but I like the metaphor. It's the idea that when you go into arena to play a sport against another person, whether that's wrestling or whatever, you, you want to, the glory and the awesomeness of the sport is in a really well-matched game. It's not in slaughtering or annihilating the opponent, right? Because all that like defeating an opponent 60 to zero proves is that you had a shitty opponent. Like you've earned nothing. So for me, it's like if I watch two people debate and the one person is just clearly like dominating the other person's argument, that doesn't make me happy because the debate isn't productive, right? The two people aren't well matched. And so agonism is, is not about defeat or victory, like it's about emphasizing the importance of the struggle itself. And that is what I love about language, is you can have a struggle over language, but instead of thinking about how it needs to mean this, no, this means that, you think about like, okay, if I believe that you know your language and you're using language, and I believe that I know my language, I'm using language that, that means something, then there must be something here for us to learn from each other. If not, we're just talking past each other, in which case, why am I bothering? So um, it's the importance of struggle itself, a struggle that cannot exist without the opponent, right? Victory through forfeit or default or over an unworthy opponent comes up short compared to defeat at the hands of a worthy opponent. A defeat that still brings honor. Um, an agonistic discourse, right? So agonistic interpersonal communication, therefore, will be one marked not merely by conflict, but by mutual admiration through conflict. And part of this comes from your signifiers. Because if you say student, if you come in my office and you're like, oh, I'm not doing well in this class, I've had trouble studying, I have a family that I have to take care of, um, I have a mental health challenge right now that I'm going through. And to me, you don't fit in my vocabulary of student, then I'm just gonna tell you to drop the class, I can't do anything for you, right? I have, that was not a worthy agonistic approach. The agonistic approach would be like, okay, you've, You've presented me a referent that does not fit my concept of student. So I'm going to assume that you're a worthy opponent, right? That you're a person who like no, like has a reason for why they're challenging my rules and policies. And I'm going to try to think about like, could I up level my language or could I up level my thought around this signifier to be more inclusive or accountable to the, to, to the person who right now feels excluded from it. That's very different than me like sitting in my office just like on pins and needles and you walking in like, hey, I have a problem with me just getting really defensive and being like, well, do my policies are right. Defend, 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 wrong, 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 defend, defend. And then you leaving and because what has happened there is I've used my power and privilege to just squash your disagreement. There's no honor in that. Like I haven't achieved anything except not to have to be challenged. So my language then doesn't have to be challenged. I just get to keep using student and my conception of student and how I think about college, right? Exactly like I always have and I don't have to change anything. That's anti-dialectical, it's binary, it's anti-agonism and it's all about me just getting to stay in my comfort zone and use language carelessly. And that is the opposite of taking a relational approach to communication. So that is where I will leave it for now. Um, it's cool over the next couple of days as this stuff is like rolling around in your brain to sort of look for examples of agonism versus antagonism and also to look for examples of dialectical versus binary thinking to try to start drumming up examples of where this happens in your life because the sooner you can recognize antagonism or binary thinking like, like coming up in you, the sooner you can start to think about how could I shift to other ways of thinking. And I, as always, I'm always interested to know like where were my signifiers problematic today or what kind of binary thinking did I engage in that made you feel excluded or what kinds of challenges, productive challenges do you have to my arguments that could help me level up this material for future classes. So that's all part of this because I'm performing verbal communication in these videos. So I should be in theory practicing what I'm preaching. And if I'm not, that's cool because as a non-binary thinker, 
who really enjoys up-leveling my knowledge and my ability to explain concepts, I'm not offended or upset. I might be a little defensive because it's human nature. When you come to me and are like, I just didn't get this. Your examples were off. I don't understand this concept. You said this contrasted with this, but it doesn't. You gave this example, but that's not true from my experience. You said this about liberals or conservatives, but I'm a liberal or conservative, and that's not how I think. I mean, those are all sort of agonistic non-binary dialectical ways of thinking and that's what helps us up level our communication with one another as practice for doing it sort of on the whole so if i never get challenged i never get smarter and if i never get challenged i never become better as a teacher and if i don't get challenged i don't learn new ways of thinking about myself so at a very basic level if you don't want to engage in any of this language stuff for other people do it because it prevents alzheimer's the same reason you should give blood. You should give blood not because, it, I mean, if you don't want to give blood because it helps other people, do it because when you take blood out, your body is forced to regenerate blood cells and it makes you healthier and you actually get like younger, right? You curb the aging process. So self-interest is always a great appeal for people. And to me, instead of focusing on all the things that using language in this creative way takes away from you, like you can't just say student anymore. You have to specify who, right? You can't say one night anymore. You have to think about who doesn't belong, right? That whole thing. Um, instead of thinking about how that robs you of your comfort and your security and your traditions and your language, think about all the things you get from it. Like you get the ability to make new language. You get the ability to uplevel your thinking. You get the ability to be smarter and fight off Alzheimer's and have a more productive, long life, right? So even if you're not doing this for any other reason, do it because it's good for you and because it's it's um if it's not the right thing to do it will keep your brain healthy and so then you can continue to argue with people until the end of time about how language is fixed and there are real definitions and there's a dictionary and we should just use that right okay um end of rant this video was eight minutes longer than my other video <laughs> so oh, i'm tired all right i will see you later